My name is Harry Tuttle, and I'm going to be talking today on. My name is Harry Tuttle, and I'm going to be talking today on increasing your modern language student speaking fluency through mobile learning. And we'd like to start out with um, thanking our sponsors. Oops, sorry, our sponsors uh, who helped us with this, like the Collaborative Australia E Series, Hub Academy, the Learning. Revolution, Coach Carroll, Shamble, uh, who have made this possible. And if you can just take a second, please, and click on your arrow and then pull one of the little smiley faces or figures over to where you are, it would help us to sort of know what's going on. Of course, it also depends on how good your geography is, I guess, in my case. Okay, and we'll hopefully wait for have some other people joining us. Oops. Did he hear me? Oh, okay. Yep, he's on. Okay, good. Okay. So, what I'm going to be doing today is to, um, I'd ask you if you could to type in the chat window your first name, your city, state or province and country, and what you teach or what you do, so that will help me to have a better feeling for, for you. So I'll Give a little bit of time to do it, if you would, please. And just make sure to press enter or return when you're done so it shows up. That's exciting. I'm glad to see people. Uh, good. It's nice to see the variety of people that we have here. Okay. And some people have a great variety of things that they're doing. But it sort of helps to have a, a feeling about this. And I have to tell you a, a quick funny story that the last time we did a presentation in this environment, people were putting where they were from, but they weren't putting what country. And so everybody's going, oh, are you from the UK? And they go, no, I'm from, you know, Massachusetts. And so it's sort of good for us to really identify the uh, place that we're from. Okay. So then we will, in just a second, we'll get Peggy a chance to log herself in with that information, and then we can, and we'll continue. Fantastic. Okay, so let's begin then. We will. Uh, today I'm going to have a basically a three-part presentation. I'm going to talk about the importance of speaking in a modern language classroom. I'm going to do an introduction to um, some of my philosophies about using mobile in the modern language classroom. And then I'm actually going to talk about what speaking activities we can use um, to uh, help our students to improve in their fluency through that. So, to me, the thing that we really want as modern language teachers is for our students to be speakers of the language. And it's interesting that we actually use the word speakers to denote when someone knows the language well. We don't call them listeners of the language or readers of the language or writers of the language. We call someone that knows the language well speakers. And so to me, that's really the focus in our modern language classes should always be how can we get our students to speak and to speak fluently in the classroom. The Alstead, the, um, the UK Office of uh, Assessment, has done many surveys on speaking in the United Kingdom, and they found three things. The first thing they found is that speaking is the least tested of any skill. The second thing they found 
is that it is the skill that the teacher teaches the, the least of of any skill. And third, it's the one that the students practice the least in their classrooms. And I'd like to hear your reactions to that, please. So if you want to type in something on the side, what's your reaction to that? while we're waiting for other people to comment, I want to clarify what the word speaking means. Um, in both the UK and uh, in the United States now it's being used, speaking does not refer to doing grammar exercises orally or to orally do vocabulary exercises. That's not considered to be speaking. Okay. So, what we want, we do not want in our language classrooms is baby talk. And this happens to be a picture of my granddaughter. And, you know, even as a baby, she makes sounds. But those sounds really don't communicate very much. And what we really want in the language is to be jamming in the language. And if you think about jamming, what happens is a person starts playing, the other musicians join in, they have a conversation with that person musically, then another person goes off on a different topic, and then the other group members join them and they interact and that's a, it's a completely interactive discussion and that's really what we want in our classrooms. So I think that this is where we want our students to be and I think we can get our students there, even beginning students. And today I'm basically going to base what I talked on the actual can-do statements and if you um, are people that belong to actual and if you want to do them, you can simply search for actful can do and download them. And actual, these statements deal with interpersonal or speaking communication, presentational speaking, writing, listening, and reading at all levels. And I'd like to know if what particular standards you are using to assess speaking. So if you'll take the time just in the side window to indicate whether you use actual standards or somebody else's standards, I'd appreciate that. In case you're not familiar, it's at both the American Council of Teachers of Foreign Languages. Yeah, someone wrote about, uh, just wrote the, the Common Core Standards. The interesting thing about the Common Core Standards is they do not include modern language. And so what happens is a lot of people are trying to use English standards to evaluate modern language. And I don't think that's what we should do. I think we should be using the actual can-do statements because they've been approved by a national organization and in fact the National Council of State Supervisors of uh, Foreign Languages. Okay, so we're getting responses back and I think it's good to know where people are coming from in terms of that. So this is an example of one of the actual statements. And uh, this is for novice high level, which is their beginning. And there's novice low, novice mid, and novice high. And I can give a short social interactions in everyday situations by asking and answering questions. And notice this happens to be personal information about home, address, email, nationality, talking about family members, friends, classmates. So those are very concrete terms that students, we can tell whether students can do these or not. So it's important for us to have something that we can measure students against in terms of their proficiency. This picture to me represents where a lot of students are in their language. They get stuck. 
and they can't get out of being stuck by themselves. They need help because no matter how much this person tries to press on the gas, to you know, go backwards, go forward, they're not going to move. They need lots of external help, and that's what we need to supply our students so that they can get better in the classroom. And there are several ways of analyzing speaking in the classroom. Um, somebody asked the question, yeah, the problem with modern languages is there's about, there's modern languages, world languages, second language, um, so there's lots of other terms for that. There are two basic ways that people have used to refer to speaking in the, in the modern language classroom. And one is the mechanical level. And this is where students speak in very short phrases or individual words. And they don't really connect things together. It's just, if you think of an old-fashioned robot talking, it's that type of speaking. And on the other hand, is the speaking that's spontaneous. You think of somebody surfing where they're constantly moving and evaluating what's going on and they're, they're changing everything. And it's a very dynamic interaction. And I'd like you to think if, in fact, if there's any other term that you're, um, that you've heard of to indicate the two different types of speaking being done in a modern language classroom. And if so, if you'll put them in the chat window, I'd appreciate it. Because different places have different terms and it's nice to know what they are. Yes, and heavy duty linguistic anthropology. Whoa. <laughs> and, and I think it's important for us to, to have whatever term it is and to think about this. There's lots of different ways. Some people refer to this as practicing versus using. Um, some people prefer to refer to it as pre communication and communication. So there's lots of different terms. But those terms, I think, have to help us to see the drastic difference between where students start out and where we want them to be. The best way that I can think of for students to improve in the classroom is for them to talk. And I think this is, it sounds like a simple statement, but in fact, the more the teacher talks, the less students talk. And so after students learn the basics, then they need more and more opportunities to speak. And so that's what we're going to be talking about, is how to help students to increase the amount that they can talk. And one of the definitions I'm going to use for improving language is the definition of fluency. And Hugh Hans has done a, a definition which is number of sentences over number of minutes. So for example, if a student says five sentences in one minute, that's the fluency rate. And it's a, such a simple way of determining fluency because it doesn't involve lots of complex things. And the thing I like about this definition of fluency is that not only can we evaluate students, but other students can evaluate students. And so it gives us an additional assessment tool in the classroom. And so I'm going to be talking about using this technique in the classroom to measure that. And that means we can always assess where students are at any given time by having them talk, see how many sentences they can say about a topic in a certain number of minutes. And as long as we use the same time each time, then we have a true measure of fluency. And I'd like to show you the spreadsheet, which is an example of every time in class my students speak, I ask them to record, they record or somebody else records how many sentences they say. And then I collect their sheets and put them in a spreadsheet. So notice I have over time what's actually happening in the classroom. So I can, you know, I can see the least days improvement from 6 to 8 to 10. Troy's improvement, and then I can see down here that Miguel has not been improving. And when I look at this, now I know that I've got to help him individually to become better. So it's a matter of students recording each other or themselves, and then my looking at that data and finding out what students I can help to become better. 
I now going to talk about mobile for a minute, a couple minutes, and then we're going to go back and combine the two. I'd like to know whether in your schools, whether you have a school supplied mobile system, whether you in fact have a BYOD, a bring your own device system where students bring their own school, or whether at this moment you don't have either. So if you can either type in school, BYOD, or nothing. While you're doing that, I'm going to respond to one quick question. Um, I always have my students record the number that they said, and I don't care. However, that's done, but I have them record it or somebody else record the data. So we have a quantity that we can measure baseline against improvement. And without that constant numerical basis, we're not, we can't make a true judgment about how, whether they've improved in their speaking or not, in their fluency. Okay, so I'm waiting for school. I'm seeing some schools, BYOD, okay, laptops, okay, school supplies, okay, good. So we've got quite a bit of variety of things happening here. And in my classroom, it's BYOD. At present, I teach in, at the college level, I teach teaching many years in public school. And BYOD presents some very interesting things uh, about it. And we're going to talk about some guidelines in a second. And most people, when they talk about mobile devices, they're talking about a, a tablet, they're talking about an iPad, a smartphone, and in the United States, Chromebook is becoming much more popular um, as a mobile device. I would suggest that a cell phone, even though it's a form of a mobile device, does not have internet and therefore is not a good tool. There are some things you can do on it, and I agree there are, but a lot of the activities I do in class require the students to have the internet. So it, it's important to think about, are there other devices that people have other than these four? And if there is so, if you can put them in the chat window. Okay, and if I don't see anything, then I'll assume that you we have these major devices. There are lots of variations on these, um, but this basically, I think, summarizes the major devices. I start off each semester with a survey of my students, and it's a rather lengthy survey, but here's my first question is, do you have a smartphone, tablet, iPad, or Chromebook? And then if so, do you have it with unlimited data? And the second question is not becoming as important anymore because they can now put their devices on the school's network. So in fact, they're not using up any data. And that's important for our schools to do that, is they have a wireless network. So as soon as students come on the campus, that they're instantly on the, the school's network, and they're not using any of their own data. And then they're willing to use mobile in, in the classroom. The biggest complaint of a reason for not using mobile is the equity issue. Not all students have it. And I think it's a valid statement. What I would suggest, though, as we go to my first guideline, is that in much of modern languages, students talk in pairs. So in fact, when my students work on mobile devices, they're almost always working in a pair or, or a small group of three. So as long as one student in the group has a mobile device, they can do the activity. And it makes it much easier that way because students can help each other in a truly collaborative fashion. There were a few times that I had them do individual things in the classroom, but since I want students to use the language in conversation, that it makes more sense to have them working together. So there's never an equity issue in my class. And in fact, a student that does not have a mobile device learns how to use a mobile device um, because their partner gives them the mobile device to do something with during their time together. Another guideline I have is that I will not do anything in my class that does not work on at least three of these devices. So any program I have should work on a tablet, an iPad, 
or a smartphone. Because I do not want to say that my classroom is an Android-only classroom, and when the students go home, they have an iPad. I don't think that's fair. I think we're going to be universal about things, and we have to have programs that everybody can use. We should get away from proprietary software and get to things that everybody can use. We may find an equivalent program on another device, and that's okay. But I think it has to be something that all students can participate in, no matter what mobile device they have. And I'm going to talk more of these, and I'm going to ask for your feedback on these. The other thing, since I'm a BYOD and I'm at the college level, whatever I use in class has to be free. And there are some good uh, free things out there that are very uh, productive in our classrooms. The thing that impresses me is when I find something that is a universal tool that does many different things. Unfortunately, many of the apps that are out there in modern languages serve a singular purpose. They teach about school, for example, and that's all they do. So it's important to me to find a tool that can do lots of different things. And I'm going to talk, for example, about the camera in just a second. It is a universal tool that can do many different activities with. I have a general guideline for any mobile activity, and that is that 90% of the activity is spent on learning or demonstrating, excuse me, your learning, and only 10% is actually on something in the, in the program that you have to manipulate or do. I never want students to be spending their time on the technology. I want them to be spending their time on learning a language. And so I purposely choose things that are very easy to use in the classroom and that students instantly begin conversations and not have to worry about how to use the technology. The most important guideline of all for me is does this app tool promote conversation in the classroom? Does it allow students to communicate? Because if it doesn't, then it's really not worth very much. You know, if, if we're talking vocabulary flashcards, they could do that in regular flashcards. But to find something that truly brings high interest to the classroom is very important. And I'd like to know if you have any other guidelines that you think about when using mobile in your classroom or in schools or that you've heard of. And if so, would you please type them in the chat window? Do you mind restating the question one more time? Yeah. My question is, are there any other mobile guidelines that you can think of? And I've given you several, but there may be some that you have that I haven't included here that you think would be helpful. Again, if there's any other guideline that you think should determine what what apps or tools you use in your classroom, it would help us to learn from each other.
Okay. Yeah. Change some things. I think one of the things I have to tell you is, for example, um, I was in a, a place where they had a policy against mobile devices. And so I found out what our major goals of the department were, and I did activities with those so my students achieved very highly on these things. I showed them to my administrator and showed them how well students were doing. And when the administrator said, wow, they're really doing well, then I said, oh, and we're using mobile device to do them. My emphasis was never on the mobile device. My emphasis was always on the student learning. And because of that, um, he said, well, I guess maybe we should change the policy. So I think that's important to do that. Someone was talking about privacy issues, and I'm not quite sure what that uh, means. So, someone could clarify that, and we can do that. So, my biggest concern right now is that modern languages is being flooded with apps, and truthfully, many of them are garbage. And I say that because many times they're being created by programmers, not necessarily by modern language teachers. And um, I one time reviewed over 150 apps. And I found very few of them really contributed to um, communication. They were very low-level vocabulary drills that they did word by word, and they never really helped people to move ahead. So we're going to talk about that. So I'm going to talk about ways now that we can bring the student's world into the classroom. And to me, that's important because once we do that, then we have high motivation. And that's, in fact, what the uh, Uh, that's in fact the, the thing that excites students and makes them want to talk about it. So first of all, I'm going to check and ask you this question. How many of you have a mobile device with you right now? If so, would you indicate it in the chat section? Okay, good. <laughs> okay, we got people that have all sorts of mobile devices. Okay, the reason I'm asking you that is the next thing I would like you to do is, is I'd like you to ask a follow-up question. Do you have a picture of a family member or a friend on your mobile device? If so, would you indicate yes? And notice all of you are coming through with guesses. And the reason I want to tell you is if we have our students bring their mobile device to classroom, they already have pictures they want to talk about. And that they're excited about talking about the people in these pictures. So I'm going to share with you an activity that I do. And that is I have one student post a picture of a family member. And then the other student has to ask questions about that picture. And I'm actually going to ask you if you have something old-fashioned like pencil and paper, that you could just copy down a variation on this chart. Where it has name, who, what, where, when, why, and it has various dates. So if you can just copy down that for a second. When you've got it, just let me know, then I'll we'll begin the, the activity. Okay, lots of people being creative in how they record it. <laughs> That's wonderful. Okay, so what I'm going to ask you to do then is and you can either do this in English or if you're a modern language teacher in a modern language, I would like you to ask different questions about this picture using different question words. And every time you say a different question word, would you record a splash under that question word? So if you ask the who question, put a splash under the who. 
If you ask a where question, put a slash underneath there. Okay, everybody ready for this? And what I'm going to do is give you about a minute to see what questions you can ask. And then when you're done, we'll come back and you're going to... No, I didn't include a how question purposely. Uh, name, and I'll talk about that later, but let's do this activity first. And so I'm going to give you a minute to see how many different questions you can ask. And every time you ask, and put a slash under the question. Okay, get ready, get set, go. No, just record this on your own sheet as you're talking. Okay, if you'll please stop. So, if you go back and look at your chart now, you should see how many different question words you asked. And generally, this activity is done in two, and your partner would be recording how many question words you asked. I'm using these questions because the who, what, where, when are part of the actual proficiency um, at the novice mid level. Um, so I have not included how, um, which requires, so right now we're just dealing with these basic questions. So I'd like you to sort of look and total your questions and see how many different questions you ask. Okay, so you can type in a number in a minute, and you can all do, hopefully do these activities in English. So. The question we ask for the chart is when we do this in pairs, the speech, student speaking does not have this chart in front of them. They have to know the five W's. They have to know these W's when they're asking. They're not looking at the chart. Only the person recording, their partner, looks at the chart. And so therefore it becomes, they really have to know, ask a variety of questions. And if you think about it, if you can ask a variety of questions, that means you have the ability to ask and find more information. So it's really important to be able to ask lots of different questions. Okay, so we saw six questions, okay? And so notice we have for uh, Peggy, we have a baseline for Peggy on her ability to ask questions about a picture. And we can do activities in class to help her get better and then keep on reassessing to see whether in fact she can ask more questions in the same amount of time which is increasing her fluency. Okay, Peggy, I appreciate you volunteering that. So it's a simple activity, but it's a very powerful activity. Every time we do a speaking activity in class, students record information on the other person speaking or their own speaking. Okay. This is a slightly different situation, and this is usually one I ask students if they have, if they can take a picture of something that that they do during the weekend. And then they bring in the picture, and then, excuse me, again in groups of two, students talk, but this time they decide whether they want to stay or leave. And so, for example, then two students would begin talking about this picture, and they each would give reasons why they either want to stay or leave doing this. So, in fact, um, I'd like you to, to quickly do that and see how many different reasons you can give why you would like to either stay or leave this particular event. And again, if you can just this time record slashes, a slash for every statement you make. Okay? So I'll give you time and then I'll refer to Peggy's question in just a second. So it's, I'll give you a minute to see how many different reasons you can give that you want to stay or leave.
Okay, if you'll stop, please. Notice this activity is much harder because you're trying to get reasons for doing something. And it really is a very real life situation. And students would do this if they were talking in their native language. But here we're asking them to do it in a second language. And so again, they count the number of slashes, the number of different reasons they gave why they want to stay or be. And in a real conversation, the partner may agree or disagree with them. So again, just a matter of slashes tells us how many they can talk about this particular thing. And notice each one of these is a different language function and language purpose. I want to go back to Peggy's question for a second about recording these questions for the teacher. You could, but my students do a tremendous amount of talking during the class, and we don't have time to record those questions per se. And if that was the only activity, then we could we could record it some way um, on their smartphone or some other device. But we have we do a lot of constantly talking, recording what you do, and getting better at it. Okay, so this activity then allowed us to do that. This is another activity where I have to I ask them to go out and take a picture of either their living room, dining room, or kitchen. Please do not ask them to take a picture of their bedroom. That sometimes results in pictures we don't want them to have. So, um, and then what we do is if each person does have a mobile device, they compare their two pictures, or if not, I always have a picture up on the screen that they can compare to this one. So, for example, I would like you to think of what are some differences between this dining room and your dining room. And I'm going to give you an example of this that um, my basic students can say. My students might say, the table, my table, uh, this table is brown, my table is blue. Okay? So, let's see how many differences you can say between this one, and again, just strike splashes, so a number of differences you can tell between this dining room and your dining room. And just record a splash every, for every difference you state. Okay, I'm going to stop you there. But again, this activity is one students are using pictures of their own home. It's a high interest activity. They, and they get really all these interesting things about comparing their homes or that. And it becomes interesting. I want to go back to something that Peggy said. And that, yes, my students always tally the information. And I always receive that information either at the end of the day or every couple of days so I can find out how they're doing. I'd like to show another version of that, and that is another activity where I ask them to use their mobile devices to take a series of four to five pictures. And then they have to tell a story, a time sequence, using those. And so, for example, here there are four pictures, and I ask students to take four pictures and then show them to the partner. And after the partner has seen all four pictures, they go back to the first picture, and the partner begins to tell the story. And notice on the side, there are there's not only slashes, which means the number of sentences they say, but there's a little star or asterisk. And the asterisk means they use the time reference. So this time, as this person is speaking, the partner is recording not only the number of slashes that they do, but also the time words that they use. Because time words become very critical in telling sequences of things. And I'm just going to let you do a short little version on this one to give you the practice. So I'll let you like words before and after, like 6 o'clock, 5 o'clock. Uh, there's lots of different time words they could be using. So I'm going to just do this for about 20 seconds. And again, keep your own splashes and stars. Okay, so we can do that. Obviously, since students 
have mobile devices, they can do voice recordings and video recordings. And I'd like to tell you about activities that I have my students in my beginning Spanish class do. They're required to have a conversation with a native speaker. And this young lady interviewed this person who happened to be a cook in a restaurant, and she asked them 10 questions about food. Someone else interviewed someone about sports. So here are students actually doing something that they're, in, they're talking with a native speaker, using their language, and most students come back and say, oh my gosh, I talked to a person and they understood me. So we have such power here for them to be able to talk and record, to record this wherever the person is, not so they're outside the class doing this. Okay. So I'm going to go on and um, take a little bit longer than I thought. Um, you all know on your mobile devices that you can do internet searches and that you can search in Google Spain, Google Italy, Google France, Google Germany, and Google Chinese. And if you search in those search engines, you end up with different results than if you search in English for the same thing. And it also means the students are probably going to find more cultural images to do this with. So that will allow them to search, and so I'm going to, I have my students do that. So for example, one of the activities I do is I have my Spanish students search for food, comida. And they go into Google Spain, they search for comida, and they pull up this list of Google images. And then I ask them to pick any one of these foods that looks good to them and tell their partner why it looks good to them. And the partner, as the partner's talking, obviously they each record how many times they say what they like about the food, and they also record every time they agree or disagree with their partner about it. So we're giving a true conversation where people aren't just making comments, but they're also interacting with each other and reacting to each other. And students like these because these are real images. And you can actually do this image with, you could do food, um, comida mexicana, you could do food plus a specific country, so if they're talking about those. So I'm just going to show you that activity. Um, the other thing that we do with searches is I find a famous store that has a product. And for example, we have just learned about clothing. So, if, excuse me, I have them go on their mobile device and search for a famous clothing store, which is Zara. And Zara has current sets of clothing. So I have the ladies together in, in pairs and the gentlemen together in pairs. And then in pairs, they describe what they like about the newest fashion and what they dislike, and then they tell whether they would wear it or not. And they're looking at these up-to-the-moment fashions from, has to be from Spain now, but you could do it in your country. You also could do this with restaurants. Um, you could have them go to a restaurant and tell what food they would like to do. And, uh, so that's a really great way to get them involved, and, and they go start from that. QR codes are a great way to do the classroom, and you can have people go quickly. I'd like to be making people aware, if you're not, that um, Please remember a QR code reader is very different from a camera picture. So make sure you have a QR code reader. And if you click on there, you'll find the map at the bottom, um, which is a, a map of Spain and the weather right now in Spain. So they actually talk about the actual weather in Spain and, and again, where they'd like to be in Spain. And I quite often use QR codes to take them to a picture that I want them to talk about. So for example, if they clicked on this picture, they would go to this. And I, they role play these two women. What's happening? Tell me where they are, what they're doing. Act like they are and discuss like they are. And so they get so involved in these, because some of these pictures they can role play so nicely and get into them. Okay. So it really, QR codes allow us to take our students quickly to something where they can begin to use their language immediately. And, do it. and notice there's no time between when they click on the QR code, they do one quick click and they're at the picture I want them to be at to talk about, or the movie clip, or whatever it is that they're going to have their conversation about. And again, they're always recording how many things they say, so we can keep track of that and, and improve on their fluency. And some people may have, over here, that some people may wonder, well, how do you create those codes? And there's a, the program I prefer is, create QR code dot com. And basically with that, they simply go to the page, type in the web address, type on the say, the size, and click the code, and they instantly have it. 
so that they can in fact create, you can in fact create QR codes. Students can create their own QR codes for things. Okay. So I'm basically what I'd like to do is leave it here. I'm going to go a couple things very quickly and then open up for questions. Um, I do have a book that has 90 activities of mobile learning in it, and these are a few of them. Um, I do have some activities online for spontaneous speaking if you're interested. Um, they're very inexpensive, and yet they all focus on um, getting the students instantly speaking up and around. Um, they're I have them for all modern languages and specifically for Spanish. So um, if you want students to begin talking, these are activities you can instantly use in your classroom. Um, and principals have thought that they were a great activity. Um, so and students like it. And they do have a book on improving foreign language speaking. So what questions do you have, please? So if you have a question, take it in the chat window and I'll catch up with you in just a second. Okay, thanks, Peggy. Um, one of the things that to me is always critical to whenever students speak in the class. We always record how many sentences they say, how many questions they say, so that we constantly can see from their baseline how much they're improving, how much they're fluency. Um, the question was, do the things, uh, uh, do the thing, you know, measure count on standardized type speaking speech test? To me, I, I know this is a, my answer is, the most important thing for a modern language student is to be able to speak the language. And I don't care what score they get on any test. I care specifically, can they speak with a native speaker? Will they be able to use the language? And I don't need to discount standard or high state test. test. Um, on the other hand, my students who do these activities score as well, if not better, than other classes. So I would say, at least on par as you do. Other questions, please. Peggy, your statement, how to get students to stop talking. You know, if, if that's my biggest problem, that they want to talk too much in modern languages, I think language class, I think that's phenomenal as long as they're teaching in the mod as long as they're talking in the modern language. I really believe that our students should talk more than we do in the classroom because they're the ones that need the practice. Yeah, I have focused on the speaking part um, of this. Um, there are obviously activities you can do for writing, for reading, using mobile. In fact, in my book, I refer to numerous of these. Um, and I think, you know, to me, I like the speaking part because that really is motivating for the students. Since we do high interest topics, they really want to talk. And the more they use the language, the more they get used to it. And I think it transfers very nicely. Um, into their writing and their reading. For example, we ask a lot of questions, the question words. So when they get to reading, and they, they know how to answer question words. Yeah, my students constantly feel like they're talking the language all the time, and they, that they feel that they can speak it. And that's a wonderful thing, because if they're willing to speak it, I have students say, yeah, you know, I felt so good about what we're doing in class, I began speaking with some of my coworkers who speak Spanish. And if we get students to that level, then I think we can feel very proud of what we've done in the classroom, that they feel, that our students feel that they can have a conversation with a native speaker.
any questions that you have, and I'm happy to answer about the topic. I hope that you use some of these very simple activities in your classrooms so that they can begin increasing the amount that they speak in the modern language. Thanks so much for this presentation. This has been really great. All right, and if anyone has last minute questions, feel free to ask. Otherwise, I'll go ahead and stop the recording. You're welcome. <laughs>